Good morning, everyone. All right. Welcome to the Land of God Fellowship. Glad to see you today. Are you excited to be here? Yeah. I'm excited to be here. Uh, and uh, I want to welcome you and, and uh, come on in and find a seat as we get started this morning. I just want to give you some encouragement. Someday, uh, maybe soon, uh, Jesus is going to return. And we get to go with him. And uh, when we come back with him, uh, he's going to reign on the earth. It's, the Bible says for a thousand years, we get to reign with him. He's going to be ruling in Jerusalem in the temple. And uh, something I was reading this week was that when he uh, is ruling on the earth for a thousand years, he's going to be teaching Torah, which is, uh, which is the word of God. And he's going to be teaching it in its purest form. How many of you know, we? the Bible says that we kind of see dimly, we don't really see clearly because sin is so pervasive, you know, that we're not real clear-minded in terms of the things of God. But God does give us insight. He does show us himself. But when Jesus comes and he's reigning on the earth, he's going to be teaching the Torah. And he is the embodiment of the word of God. And we are going to be having these moments of constant revelation of what he says. Have you ever, um, you know, had God speak to you or, or read the word or hear a message or something, and all of a sudden something hit you like, wow, wow, I never saw that before. Has anybody experienced that before? It's happening to me a lot these days, okay? And uh, some of the stuff I'm going to share with you uh, today is even part of that. And when you, when you have that revelation, the Bible says that when Jesus is right on the earth and he's teaching Torah, that we will eternally be having these moments of, whoa, wow. Whoa, that's what it says. That's what it means. That's who you are. This is what you've done. And there's hidden secrets in the Torah that we don't even know yet. And I can't wait for that day because I love to learn. I love to grow. I love to, to learn from God. But the Bible says that today is God's appointed day. Okay? This, again, is an appointed time of God to meet with us. And I believe today, as Paul prayed in Ephesians, he said, May we have the spirit of wisdom and revelation to know you more. I believe that today God wants to reveal more of himself to you and to me. Amen? That's why we're here. This is God says, meet me, meet me, and you've met him. And uh, this is a day that's never been lived before. I have no idea what God's got planned for you or for me today. But I do know that God wants to continue to reveal himself more and more to you and to me. So that's exciting to me. I just want more of him, more of him. How about you? Yeah, I hope that's encouraging to you. God is consistently and continually going to reveal himself. Even in heaven, we will still be in awe over and over again of the glory of God and the majesty of God and his strength and his wisdom and his power and, his, and all, of, all of his attributes. We're going to constantly be hitting with, being hit with waves of revelation like, wow, God, you're so amazing. Whoa, God, you're so amazing. Whoa, God, you're so incredible. And it's going to be awesome. So would you stand with me as we start our service this morning? And uh, let's just uh, go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. This is your day. And today again is the day of salvation. Today again is the day that your mercies are new toward us. And as we come together this morning, we thank you that you are here. And you're here to meet with us. And you're here to reveal yourself. And we pray that prayer that Paul wrote down for us to recite today, Lord, that you would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation that we might know you better. Lord, we long to know you more and more. Reveal yourself to us today and make miracles take place in this time that we're together where the kingdom usurps this earthly power in us that your spirit would rise up and reveal yourself, your kingdom to us, that, that we would become more like you, Lord, even in this time that we spend together. May your spirit fill this place. May we be encouraged and built up in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. 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 Let's worship Him. Good morning, church. Good morning. Your regular worship leader, Patrick, here is my nephew. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. I want to read a word from the Lord here. It's Psalm 100, verse 1 and 2. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. How many are glad today that your sins are forgiven because of Jesus? Let's try this again. How many are excited about being God's house? How many are glad that Jesus is coming back to take you with 
with him in glory. No wonder we can shout to the Lord. No wonder we can sing songs of gladness. So would you repeat this verse after me? Shout for joy. Shout for joy. Lord. Because when we see you, we find strength. 
was inspired by Scripture. It's in Revelation chapter 4. And it says that each of the four living creatures around the throne of God had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> have eyes, you know, moms always say, I have an eye in the back of my head here, you know, you can see everything that's going on. These, uh, these uh, angels that were worshiping God had wings, they were in the air, and they had eyes all around them so that they wouldn't miss anything about the glory of God, that they can see God. And, uh, and what they're doing is it says, day and night, they never stop saying, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And then at the next chapter, it goes into another new song that we sing. And we will sing this song in heaven. It says, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. This is Jesus. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. That's God Almighty. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Did you know that in a minute we're going to pray? And all of our prayers are captured by God. They're in bowls, sort of, and they're presented to God in his throne room. Isn't that awesome? Every prayer that you pray matters. And God hears them and they come into his presence in the throne room. And it says, And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. And you and I are part of that. Every people group, every tribe, every language, every nation. It is God's will that none would perish. That none would perish. But all would come to a saving knowledge through His Son, Jesus Christ. And I'm glad to, to be able to say I'm one of them. Yeah. Wow! And it's because He has purchased men for God with His blood that He is worthy and He is holy. And we worship Him. He is our Messiah. He is the promised one, and there is salvation in no other name and under heaven by which men can be saved except by the name of Jesus. Amen. Woo! Amen. That's the one we worship God who reigns. He is the one who will return, and we will reign with him on the earth. Praise God. Praise God. And as we continue to worship, we are going to come and have communion together. Uh, and as we do, that again is our opportunity by faith to receive what Jesus has done for us. Okay, the Bible says that our spirit, when we place our faith in Christ, we are forgiven of our sins, we are born again, we are a new creation, and our spirit is saved. Our spirit is saved, okay? Then we have this flesh that David was talking about that we're still living with. It's called our soul. It's our mind, our will, our emotions. And the Bible says we need that to get saved. So we're in a process of saving it according to God's Word. The Bible says transform your mind according to the Word of God. This is, a, this is how we are saved, but our soul is being saved, and then our bodies are going to be saved. When we see Him in the clouds, the Bible says in the twinkling of an eye, we will see Him, and we will be like Him. And we will be given a different body. So our spirit is saved, our soul is being saved, we're working it out, like Paul said, we're working on our salvation and our bodies will be saved. In the meantime, though, my faith is that God will equip us, even physically, to be able to do what he's called us to do. Amen. That there are heaven intersects earth right now. The kingdom intersects us. While it's not fully here, it is here. Yes. And we can tap into the healing power of God yes. for our bodies. Glory. And uh, we believe that communion is a great time to do that, to receive what Jesus has done for us on that cross. Not just the forgiveness of sins, but the healing, the healing virtue of God will flow to us. And I pray for miracles to take place yes, thank you, Lord. here this morning as His children come to a God who loves and uh, loves to give good gifts and has purchased for our healing through the blood of Christ that we might be made whole 
I just pray, Lord, that your, your outbreak of heaven would happen here on earth today. Yes, yes, yes. And we would have our minds transformed and renewed, our bodies re regenerate, regenerated with life, with the life of God. And we would be encouraged and inspired, Lord, to move into this new day and continue the work that you've called us to and run a good race that you've marked out for us to run. Thank you, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Uh, before we come for communion, we're going to collect our offering. If you have a prayer card, please put that in the in the plate so we can pray for you. Uh, before the ushers collect those, I want to offer these prayers to God. As I just mentioned, I just read that scripture. Our prayers come before God. There isn't a single prayer that God doesn't hear. He's not too busy to hear. Uh, he, he's not uh, confused by our problem, so he doesn't have an answer. His arm, the Bible says, isn't so short he can't reach down and help. He's all present, all knowing, and he is our provider, isn't yes, he? Yes. So collectively, can we just pause the plates? Collectively, I want to lift up all the prayer requests right now that are about to go into this plate in those prayers that we haven't written down that are on our hearts. We want to lift them to God. Let's lift them to God right now, Lord. You know all these prayer requests. You know all of our challenges, all of the things that we are bringing to you, all the prayers we prayed this week. Lord, we're thinking that they are all being captured, captured right now and put in these bowls of incense and brought into their very presence of the throne room right now. And Lord, that you see everyone and every one of our concerns and needs are important to you. And you are powerful enough to, to answer each and every one. And so, Lord, we turn our trust to you right now and we pray for miracles to take place, Lord. We are trusting in your wisdom and your guidance, your breakthroughs into our lives and into our family and into these situations. Lord, may your kingdom come. May your will be done, Lord, right now. In Jesus' name, we agree together with the family of God that the kingdom will be established in our lives and in the earth right here in Jesus' name. We all said amen. 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 On the night of his betrayal, Jesus took the bread and broke it. So this is my body, which has been shed for you. Take it and remember some me. And it all goes back to the cross. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood that has been shed for you. And whenever you take it, do it in remembrance of me. This represents the new covenant. The old covenant was through the blood of sheep and goats. The new covenant is through the blood of the Lamb. So when we take communion, he is here.
vacation up in Shannon Creek by Traverse City area, and we are getting pounded up there oh, yeah. with snow and wind, and I tried to leave last night, and I was getting stuck on hills, like I couldn't even get up the hill, uh, and so anyway, Craig, he got me out earlier yesterday, and he towed me from a lower parking lot in the resort up to a higher level where I could actually get out, so I'm so thankful for Craig, and I'm thankful that I'm here because I'm excited to be here. Amen. I was telling my wife last night, you know, we're in the middle of a short vacation here, and uh, I'm like, man, I really don't want to leave, but man, I can't wait to get there. Amen. I just I have a fire burning inside of me about this because I just see what God is doing in our times, and it's so exciting to me. Uh, so I want to share about uh, this message today. It's the third week of a series we're doing called The Signs of the Times. And uh, I want to get into some Bible prophecy today. And uh, I'm going to share a lot of information with you, so I hope you brought your brain with you. Okay? Turn that in. Plug it on. You know? Plug it in. Turn it on, I should say. And uh, it's kind of... The, the premise of all this is started with uh, some signs that are coming in 2014 and 2015. NASA has told us that these lunar eclipses and solar eclipses is coming in the next 18 months. I think we're uh, 79 days out from the first one. Um, and so if we throw those dates up there, what makes these lunar eclipses special is that there are four consecutive lunar eclipses, which we're referring to as a blood red moon. And in the middle, that middle date, Nisan 1, uh, is a solar eclipse. Now in prophecy and in Bible and in history, a solar eclipse represents the judgment of God coming to the nations. And the lunar eclipse represents the judgment of God coming to the enemies of Israel but it's usually connected to some suffering on Israel's part initially, followed by triumph. Okay? And I'm going to show you today some times in history when this, these signs have happened again in the past. Uh, recently, uh, in the last decade or so, NASA has developed the technology to be able to go back into history and tell us when certain things happened in the skies. They can tell us every solar eclipse, every lunar eclipse, where stars were, all the way back to Bethlehem. We can see that in Bethlehem, there was a blood red moon uh, when Jesus was born, and there was a blood red moon on the date that we believe Jesus was crucified. 
Yeah, that away. That's bonus, by the way, for sure to hear that. <laughs> You're so special. Um, anyway, I want to look at since the time, since the birth of Christ, this is what NASA says. These are the dates that this has happened before. What makes us special is that they land on Jewish holidays or Jewish festivals. And why that's important is because it is not Jewish, it's not a Jewish calendar, it is God's calendar. Amen. Okay, that's the, the stress I want to make is God said way back to Moses and the Israelites when they came out of Egypt, he said, Here's my calendar I'm giving to you. And here are seven dates I want you to put on the calendar. They're called Moedim. They're called the appointed times of God. And you will celebrate them perpetually from generation to generation. <coughs> and of these seven, the first one is Passover. The seventh one is Sukkot. And on our moons, the first one is Passover. And the last one is Sukkot. And the other ones are also Jewish holidays in the middle. Okay, so they happen right in those time frames. This is why it's significant because it's a sign from God. God said, "I would give you signs in the heavens. Uh, the blood, the, the moon would turn to blood. The, the sun would give its light no more before the great coming day of the Lord." So when God gives signs, we should be paying attention, Amen. right? Okay. So here's the, the dates in the past. There's uh, seven times since Jesus was born. Seven times that this has happened. Uh, one was in 162 to 163, Common Era, or what I grew up saying is A.D., all right? The next one was 795 to 796 A.D., and then the third one was 842 to 843 A.D., and then the fourth one was 860 to 861 A.D. But I want to talk about the next three on the calendar. Or from our vantage point, looking back, the last three times this sign has happened, we have some pretty amazing historical events that took place in our world that show a pattern of the judgment of God uh, on the enemies of Israel and major events happening in our world. And the reason we want to look at this is because at the end of this message, we want to look forward to say, what could be the meaning of this sign? This is exciting because we're about to see some fulfillment of Bible prophecy in our day. How many of you think that's exciting? Yeah. Woo, I'm excited. Okay. The last three times, a pattern has developed from the nation of Israel's perspective. And every time that we look at these, now there's going to be a time of tears that end in triumph for the Jewish people. The first one, 1492, uh, March of 30th, 1492, was the Spanish Inquisition. Okay, this is a very horrible event for the Jewish people because King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella basically said to the Jews, you have four months to pack your bags and get out of our country. They wanted everybody in their country to be converted to what was known at that time as Christianity, which was Catholicism. So you had to convert, or you either were going to convert, or be killed, or persecuted, uh, or leave the country. Those are your choices if you're a Jew in 1492 during the Spanish Inquisition. There's all kinds of stories of horrible things that happened to the Jewish people during that time. One of the things that happened, so there's the tears. The triumph. Now, this is a, a, a historical event for our modern era, and I want to read for you a statement, and this is the first sentence of Christopher Columbus's diary in 1492. It says, In the same month in which their majesties, referring to Ferdinand and Isabella, issued the edict that all Jews should be driven out of the kingdom and its territories, in the same month, they gave me the order to undertake with sufficient men my expedition of discovery to the Indies. There is some, uh, uh, there is some hint of history that the Jews uh, helped fund uh, Christopher Columbus's you know, voyage in hopes that he would find them a new land to live in. I can't totally verify that, but there is some... Some evidence of that, even Christopher Columbus, he was an Italian Jew, and uh, I'm sure he was very aware of what was going on. Actually, his first sentence of his, of his diary mentioned that. And so we know in 1492, this great country was discovered, right? We all know that date. And our country, from its beginning, has become a place for a refugee to find refuge from persecution. People from all over the world have flocked to our country for a safe haven and for freedom and for a new beginning. Amen? Amen. Isn't that awesome? And so, in a sense, 
Uh, during that time, even though the Jews were being expelled from Spain, God was doing something spectacular on the world scene, and a new world was discovered. And uh, it had begun with our Christian faith and freedom to worship God, uh, free from persecution. That's the origin of our country. Uh, I don't want to get too political, but our president did say in his term that we are no longer a Christian country. But I disagree. You cannot right. say that. Right. Our founding roots right. are a Christian country. Yes. And we were founded for freedom to, to worship God uh, without persecution. And I believe that's why God created us. And he also created us, I believe, to be a great ally of Israel to bring about his purposes on the earth. Anyway, that's a little political stuff. We'll set that aside. All right, that's not even known. So, but um, uh, I want to get on, on to just a little bit of that. There was a bishop. His name was uh, Simon uh, Miami. He was the chief rabbi, and he refused to convert, and uh, he also refused to leave, and this is just an example of what they did to him. It says he was kept buried in earth up to his neck for seven days until he died. Uh, there was just a lot of brutality going on, and uh, the Jews, if they did leave, they had to sell their possessions and their land at just ridiculous amounts just to get something out of it. Uh, either that or it was stolen from them or just taken from them uh, by the government or by the people of Spain. That's, there's a lot more history there we don't have time to get into, but it was a horrible time for the Jewish people. This was uh, in 1942. The next one I want to talk about, we are a lot more familiar with uh, in the first service. My grandfather was here, who was a World War II veteran. He was 93 years old. He served in World War II. And uh, during our history here, 1939 to 1945, was something that we call the Holocaust. It was a horrible uh, period of world history where Hitler and the Nazi regime killed, during those six years, six million, approximately six million Jews, which is one-third of the Jewish population of the world. There were about 18 million Jews living in the 1930s, and by the end of that uh, Holocaust, there was only about 12 million left. They still have not reached their numbers of population since that time. Right now in the world, there's about 13 to 14 million Jews. They haven't even recovered fully yet to the pre-Holocaust uh, numbers that they experienced. We know the horrors of that time frame in our history. It was a lot of tears, a lot of uh, sickness, death, uh, hor horrific things were happening in the death camps and concentration camps and uh, and so this was going on in 1948 and this sign came on the scene 1949 1950 and I want to share the triumph with you in just a moment but in Ezekiel chapter 37 there's a prophecy that I was talking to uh, Pastor Duane I want to give Pastor Duane Bancock a lot of credit for a lot of things I'm going to share I learned a lot from him uh, and uh, I've also done a lot of other study on my own. Uh, but he believes that this prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 37 uh, was fulfilled uh, in the Holocaust. And I want to look at that with you in just a moment. In 1948, three years after the Holocaust took place, Israel, against all odds, and against anybody's, uh, you know, wildest imaginations they became a nation can you believe it after one third of their population being wiped out the face of the earth in three years they became a nation and they were restored into the land of Israel and they will never lose that land again okay the reason I can say that is because that's what God says when he restores them to their land they're never going to lose it again we're going to talk about some wars that are coming in Scripture and look at that. But listen to this in Ezekiel chapter 37. <clears throat> it talks about a valley of dry bones. And God is talking to Ezekiel, and Ezekiel has this vision of this valley of dry bones. And God says, you see all those dry bones, Ezekiel? Can they live? <clears throat> Can they live again? <clears throat> and he says, Ezekiel prophesied to those bones. And he began to prophesy to those bones. And those bones began to rattle. Those bones began to come together. And then it got to prophesy again, and those bones began to grow, you know, the cartilage and the connective tissue. And they prophesy again, and the bones began to fill up with the body, and the bodies were still lifeless. And then it got to prophesy again, and the breath of life came into these bones, and they stood on their feet, these bones as people, and they were, they were a mighty army, a mighty and powerful, powerful vision uh, that Ezekiel had. And it was a prophecy. A prophecy. And in verse 11, this is what God says. Listen to this. 
Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. This vision is about the nation of Israel. And he says, they say, whoever, you know, the naysayers, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. No better time in history than in the Holocaust would this have applied to the Jewish people. Therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, O my people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. And I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you. And you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. Amen. Woo! 1948, May 14th, at 4 o'clock, Israel declared their statehood as a nation, their independence, and uh, this prophecy was fulfilled. Three years after the tears of the Holocaust. The, I don't know if you've ever seen, been to a Holocaust museum. I've been to two. Uh, one here in America, and I've been to one in Israel just last year. And it's horrible to see what happened. You can see film footage. You can see pictures uh, of many of the victims and the people that suffered. And when I think about this vision, it, it totally makes sense to me that when I see the pictures of the people that they're still alive, but were just their bones were protruding from their skin. They were so skinny and, and malnourished. Do you know what I mean? Have you seen those pictures? And, and if you looked at the Jewish people in 1945, a third of them wiped out and the rest of them scattered to the ends of the earth and so many of them suffering, you would have said, they're goners. I mean, there's no hope for them. And yet God in three years made a nation out of the Jewish people. This was God. This was God at work. I love prophecy, don't you? When it's fulfilled, you see that God does what he says he's going to do. And you can trust in this. This is the word, the word of God. Within hours of their declaration of independence, Israel had a war. They had a coalition of, I think, five or six Arab countries within hours come against them to try to wipe them out. This ancient hatred for the Jews uh, continued, and it was the countries of Egypt, Syria, Transjordan, which is today Jordan, Lebanon, and Iraq, came against Israel within that day, and God defended Israel. And in the next 15 months through this war, Israel's borders increased by 20%. <laughs> By 20%. Every time Israel goes to war, her borders increase. Okay? It was a miracle of God. Now, the third one I want to mention, this catches us up to um, the last time this happened, this sign of the moons and, and the solar eclipse, was in 1968, uh, or 67 and 68. Some of you know this history. Uh, another major war took place in 1967. It's called the Sixth Day War. And I want to give you the, the, the background of the war, what happened there. Egypt illegally blocked uh, Israel's access to the international waters, and they expelled from their territory the buffer zone. They expelled the United Nations uh, peacekeeping forces. Why? Because they didn't want peace anymore. So Egypt reached out to Syria and Jordan and Iraq, and they mobilized 250,000 troops on the border of Israel, and they were preparing for a full-scale invasion of the land. They wanted to literally push Israel into the sea and, and genocide again, wipe out all the Jews. They wanted to take the land and kill all the Jews. And uh, the Iraqi defense minister, there's a quote that he said this to his army, to the Iraqi army. Here's the quote. Strike the enemy's civilian settlements, turn them into dust, and pave the Arab roads with the skulls of Jews. This was their heart. They wanted to wipe them out. In Israel, what happened is they preempted them in a defensive war, and with God's help, in six days, this is what happened. From Jordan, they captured the West Bank. Okay, from, the, from Egypt, they captured Gaza and the entire Sinai Peninsula. And from Syria, they captured the Golan Heights. And their borders increased they, their borders quadrupled in six days. That's never happened in the history of the world where a nation quadrupled their borders in six days. 
Okay? Uh, this picture is a, a picture of the uh, nation of Israel in green before the war of 67. And then six days later, that is the Golden Heights. This is the West Bank. This is the Gaza Strip. And this is the Sinai Peninsula. They took all of that area in six days. God did it for them. Yeah. Lots of miracles took place that they can't explain how this all happened. Uh, now, this is not Israel today. Uh, through some policies of trading land for peace, supposedly, uh, they have since then given back the Sinai Peninsula and other areas of this land. Uh, but God is going to give it back to them because it is uh, part of the promised land, which we will see. Every time that Israel goes to war, their borders will increase. But the other thing I want to share with you, the, the reason why this war is really monumental for Israel is one thing that they did capture that I didn't mention was the city of Jerusalem. For the first time in 1,878 years, the city of God, which is what Jerusalem is, was reunited with the land of God in Israel. And Jerusalem is, if you didn't know this, it is the center of our known universe. It is the place on planet Earth that God chose to imprint His name and to dwell in His presence in the temple. And it is the place that the temple will be rebuilt. The Messiah will come. Jesus will come with us and all the angels of heaven to reign on the earth for a thousand years in the temple in Jerusalem, the city of God. He will teach the Torah from this temple, from the throne, and all the nations will come to him for a thousand years to hear his teaching and to worship Jesus. And we will be reigning on the earth with him at that time. And we sang a song, I can't remember what one it was, the words, it says, you know, something about when everything's good, I will bless your name, when everything's bad, I'll bless you, you know. But and I was thinking, oh, when everything's good, that day is coming. It's coming. The millennial reign is going to be a glorious time. All the prophecies in the Bible talk about that. Man, I'll tell you what, you want to be there. You want to be there for that. That is going to be a great time on the earth. And if you have faith in Christ, you will be there. And it's going to be exciting. All right, now I want to show you another picture. It's a picture number four, maybe, of the progression of the borders of Israel. And this, yeah, uh, this is uh, 1947, the day before Israel declared their independence. That was the land that the United Nations gave them in Resolution 181. And, uh, six, uh, and then over the next 15 months, with these countries going to war against them, they increased their borders by 20%. And then in 1967, that's all of their area again. And then, of course, they gave some of this land back. And this is today, Israel. Now, the, the, the debates right now going on, keep that picture for a second, with all the peace talks going on, we're going to talk about this next week, all kinds of stuff going on with John Kerry and trying to get these people to make peace, uh, the Palestinian Authority and, uh, and Israel, uh, is about the Palestinians say, we want you to go back to pre-1967 borders. That's their major contention. That, well, even though we were going to try to wipe you off the face of the earth and you took this land, we want you to give us all this land back to before 1967. Okay, that's their biggest thing. And the other thing is they don't want to recognize that Israel is a nation. But I shouldn't say any more because we're going to talk about that next week, okay? But just to give you a little idea of what's going on in the Middle East, we're going to talk about that. Maybe it will help you understand the situation a little bit more. But I want to go back to this blood red moons, and I want to talk about what is the meaning of this sign. Because we started this series talking about signs from heaven. And this certainly is a sign from heaven. God knew at this time of, of, our, of our life that these, you know, he was going to show us these moons and the sun. By the way, you won't be able to step outside your porch and see them, but they are happening on these dates somewhere around our world. Okay? It might be over the skies of Syria or it might be over the skies of California. I don't know. I'd have to look that up. But they're not probably over the skies of Montrose. You know what I'm saying? But they're happening somewhere on our earth at that, on those dates. Now, the thing about the Bible is my Bible right here um, is pretty thick. And a third of this Bible, about a third of this, is prophecy. <coughs> One third of this Bible is prophecy, okay? And a lot of that prophecy, hundreds of prophecies, have already been fulfilled in this Bible. This Bible, this book here, is like no other book on planet Earth. No other book in the world, in the history of our world, has prophecies in it like this book 
that have come true hundreds or even thousands of years after they were prophesied. This is, verifiably, the Word of God. Yes. Yes. Studying prophecy to me has been one of the things that has strengthened my faith the most. Because I look at some of the stuff and I'm like, how in the world would that happen hundreds or thousands of years later? Some of the prophecies that have been fulfilled have been in here for 2,500 years or more and they have come true. There's a lot left to be done, a lot left to be fulfilled. But as I mentioned last week, most Bible scholars believe that everything that needs to be fulfilled for the coming of Christ, for the rapture of the church, has been. So we are on the edges of our seat. Could be today, could be 100 years from today, but it could be today. That's what I'm saying. Okay, But there's all these other prophecies coming true. And uh, one pro prophecy I wanted to share with you today that I learned from Pastor Duane, it's just a fascinating prophecy, is about the prophecy of the city of Tyre. And this is in Ezekiel chapter 26. I want to just give you a little insight into history a little bit and read this prophecy. Now, Tyre is, back in the day here, during this prophecy, this prophecy was made in 586 B.C., a long time ago, right? That's a long 2,500 years or, or plus ago. And Tyre was a real prominent, wealthy city, and they had the, the best sailors in the world at Tyre. <clears throat> but if you go back even further to 960 B.C., King David and King Haram of Tyre had a partnership. And King Haram saw David consolidate the kingdom. <clears throat> he could tell, wow, that this is an up-and-coming young man. The kingdom's growing. I want to be friends with this guy. So he sent a gift to David. And he says, I'm going to send you all the lumber and all the craftsmen that you need, and I want to build you a palace. So King Haram did that. He sent all the lumber and these craftsmen, and they came all the way down. They sailed down to Joppa, down to Joppa, and then they you know, traversed across the land to Jerusalem, and they built King David a palace. And King David, all oh, the one thing he wanted, and, and uh, David, our worship leader here today, showed us the scripture. The one thing I desire is that I might dwell in the house of the Lord yeah. and gaze upon his beauty in the temple of the Lord. But David never got that. He never got that. He didn't get a chance to build the temple. God wouldn't let him. But he wanted to build the temple of God so bad. He spent time in God's presence with the ark, but he didn't build the temple. His son Solomon was the one that got to build the temple. And David wanted to build it so bad that he provided all the provisions for the temple. So when Solomon came on board, King Hiram from Tyre said, hey, let's make a deal. I'll keep providing you guys lumber and craftsmen so you can do whatever you want to do, build things, which ended up being the temple of God. So all the materials came from Tyre. And you guys give us food. So that's the deal. They made a, an agreement, political agreement, and they were really good friends. But something happened over the next couple hundred years. Because in 586 B.C., the temple was destroyed by the Babylonian Empire, King Nebuchadnezzar. You hear that name before? King Nebuchadnezzar. And this is what Tyre did. Uh, in Ezekiel 26, it says, In the 11th year, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel, and it said, Son of man, because Tyre has said of Jerusalem, here's the quote, Aha! The gates to the nations is broken, and its doors have swung open to me. Now that she lies in ruins, I will prosper. In other words, somehow, over those next couple hundred years, a spirit of jealousy came upon the city of Tyre. They were a wealthy, prominent city, but they were jealous of Jerusalem, and they were jealous of the temple, and they were jealous of the Jewish prosperity because we see it when they fell, when Jerusalem fell, Tyre rejoiced. And they said, yay, good for us. Now we're going to be even more prominent and we're going to be even better off because they've been, they've been uh, destroyed. And when, when Nebuchadnezzar took Jerusalem, he burned and destroyed the temple. And he scared the Jews and they went into exile. And, uh, and so Tyre was rejoicing, and this is what God said. Um, how many of you think it's a good idea to make fun of God's treasured possession? Yeah. Not a good idea. Uh, you see, Israel, from the very beginning, is part of God's master plan of redemption for you and for me. From the very beginning, in Gen Genesis chapter 12, verses 3, it says, I will bless those who bless you. He's talking to Abraham, who was the father of Israel, 
who birthed our Messiah, Jesus Christ. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and all the peoples in the world, all the peoples in the world will be blessed through you. This has been God's covenant to mankind through the nation of Israel, through Abraham, and it's fulfilled through Jesus Christ, who is a Jew, an Israelite, through the line of Abraham. From the very beginning, the devil knows the scripture. Okay? And it is a demonic, uh, devilish, uh, insp inspired the devil to be anti-Semitic, to be anti-Israel, to be anti-Jew, because the devil is trying to stop that prophecy from being fulfilled. Because he knows if that's fulfilled, he's a goner. Mm -hmm. So from the very beginning, the ancient hatred that we see in our world, even today, and I didn't mention this in, uh, in the first service, but on Friday, in the main synagogue in Rome, there was a parcel that was delivered. If you, I don't know if you've heard this story. And in the parcel, when they opened it up, it was the head of a pig. On Monday, tomorrow, is the International Day of Recognition or Memorial for the Holocaust. And in, in preparation for this international recognition of the Holocaust, anti-Semitic people uh, mailed a head of a pig to the main synagogue in Rome and to some other places to show their hatred for the Jews. You know, pigs are uh, unclean. And also, it goes back into history when an emperor slaughtered a pig on the altar, which was defiling the, the, the altar. So this was a very cruel and very hateful thing uh, that somebody did. They're still trying to figure out who did it. So in our world today, we still have the spirit because it comes from the devil. It's a hatred of God's plan for mankind's redemption. It makes no sense whatsoever for any Christian to be anti-Semitic. Because you would be anti-God if you were. You know what I'm saying? And so this is an ancient hatred that comes from the devil himself trying to stop God's plan for marching forward for the redemption of creation through the Messiah, through Jesus Christ. And we see it even at the cross when the devil thought he won, but he lost. He has been defeated. Praise God. Oh, I should have lost my spot. So here's the deal. God says, okay, Tyre, uh, here's what's going to happen. i got to hurry up and find it. And I want to read a couple verses for you. So he says, this is what the Lord says um, to the nations, the gate to the nations. Yeah, uh, therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says in verse 3. I am against you, O Tyre, and I will bring many nations against you like the sea casting up its waves. They will destroy the walls of Tyre and pull down their towers. I will scrape away her rubble and make her a bare rock. Out in the sea she will become a place to spread fish nets. For I have spoken, declares the Sovereign Lord. She will become plunder for the nations, and her settlements on the mainland will be ravaged by the sword. Then they will know that I am the Lord. How many of you know if God is against you, that's not a good thing? He's going to wipe them out. That's what he's saying. Okay, so this is what he said. The next verse says, I'm going to send Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, against you. Guess what happened that year? King Nebuchadnezzar comes to Tyre. He laid his siege to the city of Tyre for 15 years. They had a pretty decent de defense going on. He laid siege to them. But you know what they did? They were sailors. And just off the coast from their city was an island. So in those 15 years, they moved their city to the island so that they wouldn't be completely wiped out. In the midst of that time, though, by the end of 15 years, Nebuchadnezzar had completely wiped out the mainland, which we just read in Scripture, God said it was going to happen, the mainland city, and it was completely defeated. The ancient Tyre was defeated, but they removed the whole city to an island just off the coast. Do we have a picture of that island, I think? I want to show you something on this. Um, there it is. So here's where the old city was, and Nebuchadnezzar completely defeated that, but after 15 years, he, could, he didn't have any way to get to this island. Remember, they were the best sailors in the world. And they survived because they had access to their ships and trade. So that happened in 571 B.C. So half of this prophecy was fulfilled then. And then we fast forward 250 years or so to the rest of the prophecy. Down here in verse 12, it says, They will plunder your wealth and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls and demolish your fine houses and throw your stones, timber, 
and rubble into the sea. Now, this did not happen with Nebuchadnezzar. He didn't plunder them. He didn't, he didn't get rewarded for defeating that city because they all moved to the island. Um, the rubble wasn't tossed into the sea. But about 250 years ago or so, uh, Alexander the Great sent one of his best friends as an ambassador to the city of Tyre. And they killed him. And he was mad. He got really mad. So Alexander the Great, in 332 B.C., said, I am going to wipe out the city of Tyre. Because he was ticked off. So he came down and laid siege to the island. And you know what he did? He had his whole army take all the ancient ruins from the mainland and toss it into the sea to build a bridge or a causeway to the island. So he could march against the island and destroy it. it. Took them six months. They took the ancient ruins, just like the prophecy says, they will throw your stones, timber, and rubble into the sea. And he built a bridge to the island in six months' time. When he got to the island, they killed tens of thousands of the citizens of the city. He crucified 2,000, and he took the remaining 20,000 and sold them into slavery. And he plundered the very wealthy city of Tyre, and he fulfilled the rest of the prophecy. This is just one example of how prophecy has been spoken in hundreds of years. In this case, 254 years later, it was fulfilled, and we can verify it in history. One other thing I want to point out to you, this, just because it's, it's an interesting part, is that, that old slide of, uh, of the map when he started to build the bridge. These are some of the ruins of Tyre, but this map right here, this is a, an example of the bridge that he built. Today, you'll see that all of this has been filled in uh, with sediment over the years, but this is what it used to look like, this island. And this island down here, this part, is called the Island of Hercules, okay? And it is no longer there. Uh, would you go to a, another picture of the satellite? This is Tyre today, a satellite image of Tyre. The original old city is right here in ruins. Uh, part of the island here, right here, is all in ruins. The causeway was somewhere in here that Alexander the Great built. All of this is extra sediment deposited from the waters over the last several hundred years. But the island of Hercules is somewhere under the water right here. Okay? And this is what verse 19 said was going to happen. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, When I make you a desolate city like cities no longer inhabited, and when I bring the ocean depths over you, and its vast waters cover you. Isn't that wild? God buried the island of Hercules. The island of Hercules sometime in the last several hundred years uh, sunk and got buried it with the ocean floor. Isn't that amazing? This is prophecy. These are the details of how God fulfills every one of his promises. Now we know that Jesus said not a single jot or tittle is going to pass away until everything that has been prophesied in this book is going to take place. Amen. What should this do in you and in me? Man, if, first of all, it should make me go, what else is in here? Whoa, I can't wait to more of this. You know, I mean, it should do that. It also, uh, in the New Testament, the Bible says that when we believe that Jesus is coming again, which we do, I do, then it should cause us to purify ourselves just as he is pure, that we should be prepared to meet with God because there is, without a doubt, uh, God is going to do everything he said he's going to do. And he said he's coming back. Yes. Are you ready? Amen. Amen. Are you ready? Okay, now, I just got a few minutes. If you don't mind, I want to take a few minutes to introduce to you um, the concept of the sign and what could be the warning of this tetrad or this sign of the moons and sun coming. Uh, what might these signs be pointing to? Uh, what might be the next Bible prophecy fulfilled? Now, I want to share with you, many people believe it is going to be Psalm 83. Psalm 83. If I can have another few minutes of your time, I just want to introduce this idea and ask you to read the psalm this week. Next week, we're going to look at this in detail of our current situation in the Middle East because this could happen. This could happen in our lifetime. It could happen in the next couple of months or a couple of years. It really could. And uh, in Psalm 46.10, God says, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. God sees the end from the beginning. That's why he can tell us what's coming. Yeah. That's why 25 years ahead of time he can say this is what's going to happen. And it happens. Yeah. 
Or that he could say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to toss your rubble into the sea. I'm going to bury your eyes. You know, I'm going to do these things. Because that's what happened. And for God, he's outside of time. He sees it all, the end from the beginning. But Psalm 83 is written by a guy named Asaph. If you look in your Bible, if you've got a Bible in mind, uh, when I look up Psalm 83, just before the verses start, it says a song, uh, and then it says uh, by Asaph. Okay, Asaph is a, is a man, and actually he was David's chief worship leader. Okay, he'd be like our Patrick Ruff. All right, our main worship guy is Patrick. This guy was David's main worship leader, uh, and he was the main worship leader of all the things that David wanted done in far as worship for God. But he was also a seer or a prophet. A seer is another word for prophet. And so God used Asaph in Psalm 83 to bring a prophecy about to happen, we think, maybe in our lifetime. Asaph wrote 12 different psalms, Psalm 50 and then Psalm 73 to 80. But uh, 73 to 83. And so this psalm is written by a prophet whose name is Asaph. And it's about a ten-group confederacy that will come against the nation of Israel and they will find unity in their hatred for the Jews and their desire to take over their land. Does that sound at all remotely uh, familiar to you in our age right now? I want to show you a picture of the nations and the groups uh, that this song prophesies about. Now again, this was written a long time ago and some of the names of the nations or the people groups have changed but Bible scholars have traced those ancient names that we will see a little closer next week to today's modern day people groups and names. I want to show you what they are. And they're all surrounding Israel. Yellow is Israel. Okay? And I'm going to point to all the different groups real quick. The tents of Edom, uh, there are the Palestinians and the South Jordanians. So right here, that is where that group settled. Okay? The, the tents of Edom. The next name is Ishmaelites, and they are the Saudis. And, uh, and so they would be somewhere in Saudi Arabia here. Okay? The next group is Moab or the Moabites. They are the Palestinians and the Central Jordanians. So they settled right here. You can find these on your, some of your maps in your Bible. You see the Moabites were here. Uh, another name is the Hagarines, and that is for Egypt. So you have Egypt down here. Uh, Gabal or Gabal. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. But they are the, uh, the, the group called Hezbollah. You heard that name, Hezbollah, the terrorist group, and Northern Lebanese. So we're talking about up here. And Hezbollah right now is right here in Southern Lebanon as well, and they're also in this area of Syria. When I was there the other uh, last year, uh, we were staying on a mountain right here, and we saw a Hezbollah camp right there. Pretty freaky. Uh, Ammon is the Ammonites, the ancient Ammonites, and they are the Northern Jordanians up in this area and also the Palestinians. Uh, then we have uh, Amalek, or the Amalekites, and they're the Arabs of the Sinai Peninsula. This is the Sinai Peninsula. There's all kinds of unrest going on in this area of our world right now. Also in Egypt, it's crazy. They don't know what's going to happen. They're looking to do some new elections. We'll talk about that next week. Philistia is the ancient Philistines, and they are Hamas in the Gaza area, right there, that little sliver where they're shooting rockets almost... Every other day in Israel. It's been in the news like crazy. And that iron dome that they used to shoot those rockets down, just this last week they had another skirmish and they killed a Palestinian that was shooting, shooting some rockets. And last week they, they found somebody that was doing it and they killed them too. Uh, Tyre, we just talked about Tyre up here in Lebanon. It's right there. So that group uh, from Tyre is Hezbollah and southern Lebanese. And then Assyria, which is, of course, Syrians um, in this area and also part of Iraq. So, this is a pretty small map, and all the nations I mentioned are all surrounding Israel. And what's amazing is all the disunity and all the chaos over there in the Middle East, there's going to be one thing that unites all of them, and is their hatred for Israel. They will come together under one condition, that they all want to see Israel wiped off the face of the earth, and they want to kill the Jews, and they want to take their land. So this is what this uh, psalm talks about, and guess what's going to happen? When it does break out, God is going to defend Israel. Amen. Glory. Amen. There's going to be some casualties in this one. It's going to be messy, but in the end, 
Uh, somehow we got to get from where we are today to the promised land borders for when Jesus returns. It's going to happen through wars. This is the first war we're going to talk about, and there's one other war that we're going to look at. I think it's pretty much the war of Armageddon that's mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 38, 39. So if you want to read Psalm 83, that would be really cool, because next week it will make a lot more sense to you. We're going to talk about it. I hope this is interesting to you, but in the end, here's, here's my motive for us, okay? Number one, am I ready? Are you ready to meet God? Because he who has his hope that Jesus is going to return purifies himself even as he is pure. And uh, it could be during our lifetime that Jesus returns. It could be. Yeah. And either way, regardless, we don't have tomorrow promised to us. We need to be ready to meet God today. Yeah, right. Okay. The second motive, really, that I have is to inspire you to reach out to the lost. It is God's heart that none would perish. This could be the last of the last days. And there are people that need Jesus. We all need him. It's God's plan and desire that we all meet him and know him and are saved and delivered. And he uses people to reach people. Amen. Of course, it's his Holy Spirit. But we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so uh, we get the great privilege and partnership uh, to, you know, to partner with God to see lives change for eternity. I want to encourage you. We need to be thinking bigger than about our little agendas and our daily routines. We need to think about the people around us and in our world that need Jesus. Yeah. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. My motive is not to scare you. Contrary to that, to give you great, bold faith to know you are secure in the hands of God. He promises that you're going to be just fine. All right? And we're going to talk about it in a couple of weeks how fine you're going to be. He's going to save us from the wrath to come. I believe that by my heart. I, because uh, he says this in the scriptures. It's going to be just like the days of Noah. Just like the days uh, of Sodom and Gomorrah. In Noah's time, guess who got saved? Noah and his family. The righteous were delivered. Yes. Who got saved in Sodom and Gomorrah? Lot. The righteous Lot and his family were delivered. Guess who's going to be saved from the wrath to come? Mm -hmm. The righteous, which is those who by faith... <laughs> In Christ Jesus, have had their sins forgiven. We are going to be delivered from the wrath of God. And we want a full bolt. We want a full bolt. We want to pack it in. Don't we? That's the heart of God. And the reason he gives these signs is so that we know the times that we live in, so that all would turn to God. The signs are there to draw us to him. The prophecies, prophecies there are to say, yes, he's real. This is the word of God. I can trust him with my whole life. It's undeniable. There's no yeah. way these things can be happening yeah. to this great detail unless this is the word of God. Right. And if this is the word of God, the things that have yet to happen, wow, they're going to happen. Yes, I believe them, and I'm going to give my whole life to this awesome God who loves me yeah. and who has promised me everlasting life in him. Yeah. Woo, that's our heart. That's our heart. And I hope that you're feeling that and picking that up from, from this message. So would you stand with me? I'm going to close and I'll pray a blessing on you. Um, and uh, I want to encourage you to invite people again to our, our marriage conference. You can sign up for that. But let's even use that as a means to reach out to people around us. And uh, this morning, before we go, if there's any doubt in your heart where you stand with God, that's the most important decision you want to make in your life is are you, are you right with God? And the Bible makes it clear the only way that we become right with God is through Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And when we do have faith in Jesus and when we do trust in Him with our lives, the Bible makes it very clear that we are forgiven. That we are right with God. That we can know that we're right with Him because our spirit is born again. You know what I'm saying? The Bible says that uh, our sins are buried uh, on the floor of the ocean. That they're separated from us as far as the east is from the west, which is an infinite distance. Because you cannot calculate how far east is from west. They just keep going. Right? right? right. You can't calculate that distance. And God says, and I'm going to forget them. Yeah. I'm going to have selective amnesia. And I will forget your sins. And though you are scarlet, yet you will be to me as white as snow. And we got lots of snow around. Lots of mercy. <laughs> covering up our flaws and God God loves you he loves me he's calling you to him if there's any doubt in your heart at all 
I, I want you to pray a prayer with me today to give your life to Jesus. Remove that doubt so that you have the assurance of your salvation. Amen. That's why you're still here. Amen? Amen. Would you bow your heads with me? And if that's your heart and you want to pray that with me, would you lift your hand right where we are right now? Say, Pastor, I'm joining you in that prayer. Thank you. I see your hands there and your hands there. Your hands there. Thank you. I just appreciate your heart responding to the love of God. Thank you, sir. I see your hand there, too. And all those hands that are raised, you know, we celebrate today that the Word of God is real. Yeah. And when we come to Him, the Word of God says that our sins are forgiven. Yes. And we are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And today, His Spirit is going to come upon you and begin to change your heart and empower you to live the life God's called you to live. Praise God. Yes. So let's pray this prayer together and say this with me. Say, Father God, Thank you for loving me and creating me to be with you forever and providing your son Jesus to die on the cross, to pay for my sins, that I can be reunited with you. Today I place my faith in you, Jesus. Forgive me of my sins. I commit myself to you and I declare you as my Lord. Fill me with your spirit so I have the power to live this new life that you created for me to live. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your act of salvation today. Thank you, Lord, for your great mercy has visited us. Lord, I pray for those that just raise their hand, God, that you would just encourage them. Feel the Lord, your peace right now, that they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that, Lord, you are real, that you have forgiven them, that your spirit is upon them, to equip them, and build them up, and encourage them to live this great life. Lord, that our days may be short, we're not sure, but they certainly are filled with great purpose and destiny. Now, Lord, may you inspire us all this morning and this week to live our lives fully for you and for the kingdom, to seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. Help us, Lord, in our weakness. Help us, Lord, overcome the flesh. Help us overcome our, our stumblings. Help us to keep our eyes on you, Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We turn to you, Lord. We give this day to you. We give this week to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me bless you as you go, okay? This is the Lord's blessing. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, that nothing would be broken and nothing would be missing in your life in his name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.